The Penny Catechism, 370 Fundamental Questions and Answers on the Catholic Faith. This catechism of Christian doctrine has been approved by the archbishops and bishops of England and Wales. A similar one is in use in Ireland. Neil Upstott, Johannes M. T. Barton, Imprimatur, Georges L. Craven. An Introduction The acceptance of the Penny Catechism in the U.S. has been so much greater than I had expected when I first introduced it. Since then it has been selling like hotcakes. The response to this little book has been nothing short of a major happening in my years of publishing. Again, I want to say that many good developments in catechetical training have taken place since the Penny Catechism was first written and introduced into the schools of Ireland and Britain. Some excellent methods which have been introduced in the last generation or so do help the student to understand deeper as he learns. However, I have not been convinced that the rote method has lost its usefulness. As a matter of fact, I believe that this is the only method for the very young. We have evidence of its effectiveness in TV, where it is used in all kinds of programming for children. The fact that the first and second printings of the Penny Catechism were sold in a few months may also prove something. Learning to understand the teachings of the Catholic Church is a lifetime undertaking. We start as very small children in the arms of our mothers. Fathers, too, must play a large role. But it is for the Catholic teacher, wherever possible, to use a more formal method. If understanding and living the faith is a lifetime job for all of us, one cannot expect young children to grasp more than the fundamentals to begin with. They are certainly open, with God's grace, to take hold of the essentials and begin to deepen as they mature. Actually, it is quite natural for children to accept the mysteries of our religion from a very early age. Perhaps one of the fallacies of today's teaching of religion is the oversimplifying, and sometimes giving wrong interpretations in so doing, the very truths which are the basis of the Catholic religion. The teachers of children, parents, and school teachers alike must remember that religion is not a natural science. God, through his grace, plays the important role in getting across the message. It is important that children at a tender age be given the opportunity to graft into their memories the truths of our faith as defined in the Penny Catechism. They certainly will not be expected to understand their depth, but afterwards, as the children grow into maturity, they will be able to recall the clear definitions and begin to see how the exactness of these definitions can be the guide to develop right consciences. The Penny Catechism is also an excellent little reference for adults. One reader suggested that grown Catholics would do well to review this little book at least once a year. This is a wonderful idea, particularly now at a time when there seems to be so much doctrinal confusion. The Penny Catechism is also meant to provoke the grown reader into further reading, which expands and explains the fundamentals of this little book. Prow Books has published Father McGuire's new modern catechism, Know, Love, and Serve, in five volumes. Father McGuire, who a generation ago did his well-known catechism, has more than brought the old one up to date. No love and serve is completely new with the very best of modern methods, without in any way watering down the doctrine. Signed, W. Doyle Gilligan. Chapter 1. Faith. Who made you? God made me. Why did God make you? God made me to know him, love him, and serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in the next. To whose image and likeness did God make you? God made me to his own image and likeness. Is this likeness to God in your body or in your soul? This likeness to God is chiefly in my soul. How is your soul like to God? My soul is like to God because it is a spirit 
and is immortal. What do you mean when you say that your soul is immortal? When I say my soul is immortal, I mean that my soul can never die. Of which must you take most care, of your body or of your soul? I must take most care of my soul, for Christ has said, What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and suffer the loss of his own soul? Matthew chapter 16 verse 26 What must you do to save your soul? To save my soul, I must worship God by faith, hope, and charity. That is, I must believe in him, I must hope in him, and I must love him with my whole heart. What is faith? Faith is a supernatural gift of God, which enables us to believe without doubting whatever God has revealed. Why must you believe whatever God has revealed? I must believe whatever God has revealed because God is the very truth and can neither deceive nor be deceived. How are you to know what God has revealed? I am to know what God has revealed by the testimony, teaching, and authority of the Catholic Church. Who gave the Catholic Church divine authority to teach? Jesus Christ gave the Catholic Church divine authority to teach when he said, Go and teach all nations. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. The Apostles' Creed. What are the chief things which God has revealed? The chief things which God has revealed are contained in the Apostles' Creed. Say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. How is the Apostles' Creed divided? The Apostles' Creed is divided into twelve parts, or articles. First article of the Creed. What is the first article of the Creed? The first article of the Creed is, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. What is God? God is the Supreme Spirit, who alone exists of himself and is infinite in all perfections. Why is God called Almighty? God is called Almighty because he can do all things. With God, all things are possible. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Why is God called creator of heaven and earth? God is called creator of heaven and earth because he made heaven and earth and all things out of nothing by his word. Had God any beginning? God had no beginning. He always was, he is, and he always will be. Where is God? God is everywhere. Does God know and see all things? God knows and sees all things, even our most secret thoughts. Has God any body? God has no body. He is a spirit. Is there only one God? There is only one God. Are there three persons in God? There are three persons in God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Are these three persons three gods? These three persons are not three gods. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one and the same God. What is the mystery of the three persons in one God called? The mystery of the three persons in one God is called the mystery of the Blessed Trinity. What do you mean by a mystery? 
By a mystery I mean a truth which is above reason, but revealed by God. Is there any likeness to the Blessed Trinity in your soul? There is this likeness to the Blessed Trinity in my soul, that as in one God there are three persons, so in my one soul there are three powers. What are the three powers of your soul? The three powers of my soul are my memory, my understanding, and my will. The second article. What is the second article of the creed? The second article of the creed is, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Who is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is God the Son, made man for us. Is Jesus Christ truly God? Jesus Christ is truly God. Why is Jesus Christ truly God? Jesus Christ is truly God because he has one and the same nature with God the Father. Was Jesus Christ always God? Jesus Christ was always God, born of the Father from all eternity. Which person of the Blessed Trinity is Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Is Jesus Christ truly man? Jesus Christ is truly man. Why is Jesus Christ truly man? Jesus Christ is truly man because he has the nature of man, having a body and soul like ours. Was Jesus Christ always man? Jesus Christ was not always man. He has been man only from the time of his incarnation. What do you mean by the incarnation? I mean by the incarnation that God the Son took to himself the nature of man. The word was made flesh. John chapter 1 verse 14. How many natures are there in Jesus Christ? There are two natures in Jesus Christ, the nature of God and the nature of man. Is there only one person in Jesus Christ? There is only one person in Jesus Christ, which is the person of God the Son. Why was God the Son made man? God the Son was made man to redeem us from sin and hell and to teach us the way to heaven. What does the holy name Jesus mean? The holy name Jesus means Savior. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. What does the name Christ mean? The name Christ means anointed. Where is Jesus Christ? As God, Jesus Christ is everywhere. As God made man, he is in heaven and in the blessed sacrament on the altar. The third article. What is the third article of the creed? The third article of the creed is who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. What does the third article mean? The third article means that God the Son took a body and soul like ours in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. Had Jesus Christ any father on earth? Jesus Christ had no father on earth. St. Joseph was only his guardian or foster father. Where was our Savior born? Our Savior was born in a stable at Bethlehem. On what day was our Savior born? Our Savior was born on Christmas Day. The fourth article. What is the fourth article of the creed? The fourth article of the creed is, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. What were the chief sufferings of Christ? The chief sufferings of Christ were, first, his agony and his sweat of blood in the garden, secondly, his being scourged at the pillar and crowned with thorns, and thirdly, his carrying his cross, his crucifixion, and his death between two thieves. What are the chief sufferings of our Lord called? 
the chief sufferings of our Lord are called the Passion of Jesus Christ. Why did our Savior suffer? Our Savior suffered to atone for our sins and to purchase for us eternal life. Why is Jesus Christ called our Redeemer? Jesus Christ is called our Redeemer because his precious blood is the price by which we were ransomed. On what day did our Savior die? Our Savior died on Good Friday. Where did our Savior die? Our Savior died on Mount Calvary. Why do we make the sign of the cross? We make the sign of the cross first to put us in mind of the Blessed Trinity and secondly to remind us that God the Son died for us on the cross. In making the sign of the cross, how are we reminded of the Blessed Trinity? In making the sign of the cross, we are reminded of the Blessed Trinity by the words, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In making the sign of the cross, how are we reminded that Christ died for us on the cross? In making the sign of the cross, we are reminded that Christ died for us on the cross by the very form of the cross which we make upon ourselves. The fifth article. What is the fifth article of the creed? The fifth article of the creed is, he descended into hell, the third day he rose again from the dead. What do you mean by the words, he descended into hell? By the words, he descended into hell, I mean that as soon as Christ was dead, his blessed soul went down into that part of hell called limbo. What do you mean by limbo? By limbo, I mean a place of rest where the souls of the just who died before Christ were detained. Why were the souls of the just detained in limbo? The souls of the just were detained in limbo because they could not go up to the kingdom of heaven till Christ had opened it for them. What do you mean by the words, the third day he rose again from the dead? By the words, the third day he rose again from the dead, I mean that after Christ had been dead and buried part of three days, he raised his blessed body to life again on the third day. On what day did Christ rise again from the dead? Christ rose again from the dead on Easter Sunday. The sixth article. What is the sixth article of the creed? The sixth article of the creed is, He ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. What do you mean by the words, He ascended into heaven? By the words, He ascended into heaven, I mean that our Savior went up body and soul into heaven on Ascension Day, 40 days after his resurrection. What do you mean by the words, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty? By the words, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, I do not mean that God the Father has hands, for he is a spirit, but I mean that Christ, as God, is equal to the Father, and as man, is in the highest place in heaven. The seventh article. What is the seventh article of the creed? The seventh article of the creed is, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. When will Christ come again? Christ will come again from heaven at the last day to judge all mankind. What are the things Christ will judge? Christ will judge our thoughts, words, works, and omissions. What will Christ say to the wicked? Christ will say to the wicked, Depart from me, cursed, into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. What will Christ say to the just? Christ will say to the just, Come, you blessed of my Father, possess you the kingdom prepared for you. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Will everyone be judged at death 
as well as at the last day? Everyone will be judged at death as well as at the last day. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. The eighth article. What is the eighth article of the creed? The eighth article of the creed is, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Blessed Trinity. From whom does the Holy Spirit proceed? The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Is the Holy Spirit equal to the Father and to the Son? The Holy Spirit is equal to the Father and to the Son, for he is the same Lord and God as they are. When did the Holy Spirit come down on the apostles? The Holy Spirit came down on the apostles on Pentecost in the form of parted tongues, as it were, of fire. Acts chapter 2, verse 3. Why did the Holy Spirit come down on the apostles? The Holy Spirit came down on the apostles to confirm their faith, to sanctify them, and to enable them to found the church. The ninth article. What is the ninth article of the creed? The ninth article of the creed is the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints. What is the Catholic Church? The Catholic Church is the union of all the faithful under one head. Who is the head of the Catholic Church? The head of the Catholic Church is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Has the Church a visible head on earth? The Church has a visible head on earth, the Bishop of Rome, who is the Vicar of Christ. Why is the Bishop of Rome the head of the Church? The Bishop of Rome is the head of the Church because he is the successor of St. Peter, whom Christ appointed to be head of the Church. How do you know that Christ appointed St. Peter to be the head of the Church? I know that Christ appointed St. Peter to be the head of the church because Christ said to him, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And to you I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 16 verses 18 and 19. What is the Bishop of Rome called? The Bishop of Rome is called the Pope which word signifies father. Is the Pope the spiritual father of all Christians? The Pope is the spiritual father of all Christians. Is the Pope the shepherd and teacher of all Christians? The Pope is the shepherd and teacher of all Christians because Christ made St. Peter the shepherd of the whole flock when he said, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. He also prayed that his faith might never fail and commanded him to confirm his brethren. John chapter 21 verses 15 to 17 and Luke chapter 22 verse 32. Is the Pope infallible? The Pope is infallible. What do you mean when you say that the Pope is infallible? When I say that the Pope is infallible, I mean that the Pope cannot err when as shepherd and teacher of all Christians, he finds a doctrine concerning faith or morals to be held by the whole church. Has the Church of Christ any marks by which we may know her? The Church of Christ has four marks by which we may know her. She is one, she is holy, she is Catholic, she is apostolic. How is the church one? The church is one because all her members agree in one faith, have all the same sacrifice and sacraments, and are all united under one head. How is the church holy? The church is holy because she teaches a holy doctrine, offers to all the means of holiness, and is distinguished by the eminent holiness of so many thousands of her children. What does the word Catholic mean? 
The word Catholic means universal. How is the church Catholic or universal? The church is Catholic or universal because she subsists in all ages, teaches all nations, and is the one ark of salvation for all. How is the church apostolic? The church is apostolic because she holds the doctrines and traditions of the apostles, and because, through the unbroken succession of her pastors, she derives her orders and her mission from them. Can the church err in what she teaches? The church cannot err in what she teaches as to faith or morals, for she is our infallible guide in both. How do you know that the church cannot err in what she teaches? I know that the church cannot err in what she teaches because Christ promised that the gates of hell shall never prevail against his church, that the Holy Spirit shall teach her all things, and that he himself will be with her all days, even to the consummation of the world. Matthew chapter 16 verse 18, John chapter 14 verses 16 to 26, and Matthew chapter 28 verse 20. What do you mean by the communion of saints? By the communion of saints I mean that all the members of the church in heaven, on earth, and in purgatory are in communion with each other as being one body in Jesus Christ. How are the faithful on earth in communion with each other? The faithful on earth are in communion with each other by profession of the same faith, obeying the same authority, and assisting each other with their prayers and good works. How are we in communion with the saints in heaven? We are in communion with the saints in heaven by honoring them as the glorified members of the church, and also by our praying to them and by their praying for us. How are we in communion with the souls in purgatory? We are in communion with the souls in purgatory by helping them with our prayers and good works. It is a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from sins. 2 Maccabees chapter 12 verse 46. What is purgatory? Purgatory is a place where souls suffer for a time after death on account of their sins. What souls go to purgatory? Those souls go to purgatory that depart this life in venial sin, or that have not fully paid the debt of temporal punishment due to those sins of which the guilt has been forgiven. What is temporal punishment? Temporal punishment is punishment which will have an end, either in this world or in the world to come. How do you prove that there is a purgatory? I prove that there is a purgatory from the constant teaching of the church and from the doctrine of Holy Scripture, which declares that God will render to every man according to his works, that nothing defiled shall enter heaven, and that some will be saved yet so as by fire. Matthew chapter 16 verse 27 Apocalypse chapter 21, verse 27, and 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. What is the tenth article of the creed? The tenth article of the creed is the forgiveness of sins. What do you mean by the forgiveness of sins? By the forgiveness of sins, I mean that Christ has left the power of forgiving sins to the pastors of his church. John chapter 20, verse 23. By what means are sins forgiven? Sins are forgiven principally by the sacrament of baptism and penance. What is sin? Sin is an offense against God by any thought, word, deed, or omission against the law of God. How many kinds of sin are there? There are two kinds of sin, original sin and actual sin. What is original sin? 
Original sin is that guilt and stain of sin which we inherit from Adam, who was the origin and head of all mankind. What was the sin committed by Adam? The sin committed by Adam was the sin of disobedience when he ate the forbidden fruit. Has all mankind contracted the guilt and stain of original sin? All mankind has contracted the guilt and stain of original sin, except the Blessed Virgin, who through the merits of her divine Son was conceived without the least guilt or stain of original sin. What is this privilege of the Blessed Virgin called? This privilege of the Blessed Virgin is called the Immaculate Conception. What is actual sin? Actual sin is every sin which we ourselves commit. How is actual sin divided? Actual sin is divided into mortal sin and venial sin. What is mortal sin? Mortal sin is a grievous offense against God. Why is it called mortal sin? It is called mortal sin because it kills the soul and deserves hell. How does mortal sin kill the soul? Mortal sin kills the soul by depriving it of sanctifying grace, which is the supernatural life of the soul. Is it a great evil to fall into mortal sin? It is the greatest of all evils to fall into mortal sin. Where will they go who die in mortal sin? They who die in mortal sin will go to hell for all eternity. What is venial sin? Venial sin is an offense which does not kill the soul, yet displeases God and often leads to mortal sin. Why is it called venial sin? It is called venial sin because it is more easily pardoned than mortal sin. What is the eleventh article of the creed? The eleventh article of the creed is the resurrection of the body. What do you mean by the resurrection of the body? By the resurrection of the body, I mean that we shall all rise again with the same bodies at the day of judgment. The twelfth article. What is the twelfth article of the creed? The twelfth article of the creed is life everlasting. What does life everlasting mean? Life everlasting means that the good shall live forever in the glory and happiness of heaven. What is the glory and happiness of heaven? The glory and happiness of heaven is to see, love, and enjoy God forever. What does the scripture say of the happiness of heaven? The scripture says of the happiness of heaven that eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what things God has prepared for them that love him. Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. Shall not the wicked also live forever? The wicked also shall live and be punished forever in the fire of hell. Chapter 3. Hope. Will faith alone save us? Faith alone will not save us without good works. We must also have hope and charity. What is hope? Hope is a supernatural gift of God by which we firmly trust that God will give us eternal life and all the means necessary to obtain it if we do what he requires of us. Why must we hope in God? We must hope in God because he is infinitely good, infinitely powerful, and faithful to his promises. Can we do any good work of ourselves toward our salvation? We can do no good work of ourselves towards our salvation. We need the help of God's graces. What is grace? Grace is a supernatural gift of God, freely bestowed upon us for our sanctification and salvation. How must we obtain God's grace? We must obtain God's grace chiefly by prayer and the holy sacraments. Prayer. What is prayer? 
Prayer is the raising up of the mind and heart to God. How do we raise up our mind and heart to God? We raise up our mind and heart to God by thinking of God, by adoring, praising, and thanking Him, and by begging of Him all blessings for soul and body. Do those pray well who at their prayers think neither of God nor of what they say? Those who at their prayers think neither of God nor of what they say do not pray well, but they offend God if their distractions are willful. Which is the best of all prayers? The best of all prayers is the Our Father, or the Lord's Prayer. Who made the Lord's Prayer? Jesus Christ himself made the Lord's Prayer. Say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the Lord's Prayer, who is called our Father? In the Lord's Prayer, God is called our Father. Why is God called our Father? God is called our Father because he is the Father of all Christians, whom he has made his children by holy baptism. Is God also the Father of all mankind? God is also the Father of all mankind because he made them all and loves and preserves them all. Why do we say our Father and not my Father? We say our Father and not my Father because being all brethren, we are to pray not for ourselves only, but also for all others. When we say, Hallowed be thy name, what do we pray for? When we say, Hallowed be thy name, we pray that God may be known, loved, and served by all his creatures. When we say, Thy kingdom come, what do we pray for? When we say, Thy kingdom come, we pray that God may come and reign in the hearts of all by his grace in this world and bring us all hereafter to his heavenly kingdom. When we say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, what do we pray for? When we say, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we pray that God may enable us, by his grace, to do his will in all things, as the blessed do in heaven. When we say, Give us this day our daily bread, what do we pray for? When we say, Give us this day our daily bread, we pray that God may give us daily all that is necessary for soul and body. When we say, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, what do we pray for? When we say, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, we pray that God may forgive us our sins as we forgive others the injuries they do to us. When we say, Lead us not into temptation, what do we pray for? When we say, Lead us not into temptation, we pray that God may give us grace not to yield to temptation. When we say, Deliver us from evil, what do we pray for? When we say, Deliver us from evil, we pray that God may free us from all evil, both of soul and body. Should we ask the angels and saints to pray for us? We should ask the angels and saints to pray for us because they are, are our friends and brethren and because their prayers have great power with God. How can we show that the angels and saints know what passes on earth? We can show that the angels and saints know what passes on earth from the words of Christ. There shall be joy before the angels of God upon one sinner doing penance. Luke chapter 15 verse 10. What is the chief prayer to the Blessed Virgin which the Church uses? 
The chief prayer to the Blessed Virgin, which the Church uses, is the Hail Mary. Say the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Who made the first part of the Hail Mary? The angel Gabriel and Saint Elizabeth, inspired by the Holy Spirit, made the first part of the Hail Mary. Who made the second part of the Hail Mary? The Church of God, guided by the Holy Spirit, made the second part of the Hail Mary. Why should we frequently say the Hail Mary? We should frequently say the Hail Mary to put us in mind of the incarnation of the Son of God and to honor our Blessed Lady, the Mother of God. Have we another reason for often saying the Hail Mary? We have another reason for often saying the Hail Mary, to ask our Blessed Lady to pray for us sinners at all times, but especially at the hour of our death. Why does the Catholic Church show great devotion to the Blessed Virgin? The Catholic Church shows great devotion to the Blessed Virgin because she is the Immaculate Mother of God. How is the Blessed Virgin Mother of God? The Blessed Virgin is Mother of God because Jesus Christ, her Son, who was born of her as man, is not only man, but is also truly God. Is the Blessed Virgin our Mother also? The Blessed Virgin is our Mother also because being the brethren of Jesus, we are the children of Mary. We will continue with the Pentecatechism, Questions and Answers on the Catholic Faith, on side B of this tape. We continue now with the Pentecatechism, Fundamental Questions and Answers on the Catholic Faith. Chapter 4, Charity, The Commandments of God, What is Charity? Charity is a supernatural gift of God by which we love God above all things and our neighbor as ourselves for God's sake. Why must we love God? We must love God because he is infinitely good in himself and infinitely good to us. How do we show that we love God? We show that we love God by keeping his commandments, for Christ says, If you love me, keep my commandments. John chapter 14, verse 15. How many commandments are there? There are ten commandments. Say the ten commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. You shall not have strange gods before me. You shall not make yourself any graven thing nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath nor of those things that are in the waters under the earth. You shall not adore them, nor serve them. Two, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Three, remember that you keep holy the Sabbath day. Four, honor your father and your mother. Five, you shall not kill. Six, you shall not commit adultery. Seven, you shall not steal. Eight, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Nine, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And ten, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. Who gave the Ten Commandments? God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses in the Old Law, and Christ confirmed them in the New. What is the First Commandment? The First Commandment is, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. You shall not have strange gods before me. You shall not make to yourself any graven thing nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above or in the earth beneath, nor of those things that are in the waters under the earth. You shall not adore them nor serve them. 
What are we commanded to do by the first commandment? By the first commandment, we are commanded to worship the one true and living God by faith, hope, charity, and religion. What are the sins against faith? The sins against faith are all false religions, willful doubt, disbelief, or denial of any article of faith, and also culpable ignorance of the doctrines of the church. How do we expose ourselves to the danger of losing our faith? We expose ourselves to the danger of losing our faith by neglecting our spiritual duties, reading bad books, going to non-Catholic schools, and taking part in the services or prayers of a false religion. A footnote, parents have the obligation to send their children to schools that are Catholic whenever possible, but only insofar as these schools are really Catholic and teach according to the magisterium of the church. What are the sins against hope? The sins against hope are despair and presumption. What are the chief sins against religion? The chief sins against religion are the worship of false gods or idols and the giving to any creature whatsoever the honor which belongs to God alone. Does the first commandment forbid the making of images? The first commandment does not forbid the making of images, but the making of idols, that is, it forbids us to make images to be adored or honored as gods. Does the first commandment forbid dealing with the devil and superstitious practices? The first commandment forbids all dealing with the devil and superstitious practices, such as consulting spiritualists and fortune tellers, and trusting to charms, omens, dreams, and such like fooleries. Are all sins of sacrilege and simony also forbidden by the first commandment? All sins of sacrilege and simony are also forbidden by the first commandment. Is it forbidden to give divine honor or worship to the angels and saints? It is forbidden to give divine honor or worship to the angels and saints, for this belongs to God alone. What kind of honor or worship should we pay to the angels and saints? We should pay to the angels and saints an inferior honor or worship, for this is due them as the servants and special friends of God. What honor should we give to relics, crucifixes, and holy pictures? We should give to relics, crucifixes, and holy pictures a relative honor as they relate to Christ and his saints and our memorials of them. Do we pray to relics or images? We do not pray to relics or images, for they can neither see nor hear nor help us. What is the second commandment? The second commandment is, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What are we commanded by the second commandment? By the second commandment, we are commanded to speak with reverence of God and all holy persons and things and to keep our lawful oaths and vows. What does the second commandment forbid? The second commandment forbids all false, rash, unjust, and unnecessary oaths, as also blaspheming, cursing, and profane words. Is it ever lawful to swear or to take an oath? It is lawful to swear or to take an oath only when God's honor or our own or our neighbor's good requires it. What is the third commandment? The third commandment is, remember that you keep holy the Sabbath. What are we commanded by the third commandment? By the third commandment, we are commanded to keep the Sunday holy. How are we to keep the Sunday holy? We are to keep the Sunday holy by hearing mass and resting from servile works. Why are we commanded to rest from servile works? We are commanded to rest from servile works that we may have time and opportunity for prayer, going to the sacraments, hearing instructions, 
and reading good books. What is the fourth commandment? The fourth commandment is, honor your father and your mother. What are we commanded by the fourth commandment? By the fourth commandment we are commanded to love, reverence, and obey our parents in all that is not sin. Are we commanded to obey our parents only? We are commanded to obey not only our parents, but also our bishops and pastors, the civil authorities, and our lawful superiors. Are we bound to assist our parents in their wants? We are bound to assist our parents in their wants, both spiritual and temporal. Are we bound in justice to contribute to the support of our pastors? We are bound in justice to contribute to the support of our pastors, for St. Paul says, the Lord ordained that they who preach the gospel should live by the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 14. What is the duty of parents toward their children? The duty of parents towards their children is to provide for them, to instruct and correct them, and to give them a good Catholic education. What is the duty of masters, mistresses, and other superiors? The duties of masters, mistresses, and other superiors is to take proper care of those under their charge and to enable them to practice their religious duties. What does the fourth commandment forbid? The fourth commandment forbids all contempt, stubbornness, and disobedience to our parents and lawful superiors. Is it sinful to belong to a secret society? It is sinful to belong to any secret society that plots against the church or state, or to any society that by reason of its secrecy is condemned by the church. For St. Paul says, let every soul be subject to the higher powers. He that resists the power resists the ordinance of God, and they that resist purchase to themselves damnation. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2. What is the fifth commandment? The fifth commandment is, you shall not kill. What does the fifth commandment forbid? The fifth commandment forbids all willful murder, fighting, quarreling, and injurious words, and also scandal and bad example. Does the fifth commandment forbid anger? The fifth commandment forbids anger, and still more, hatred and revenge. Why are scandal and bad example forbidden by the fifth commandment? Scandal and bad example are forbidden by the fifth commandment because they lead to the injury and spiritual death of our neighbor's soul. What is the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment is, you shall not commit adultery. What does the sixth commandment forbid? The sixth commandment forbids all sins of impurity with another's wife or husband. Does the sixth commandment forbid whatever is contrary to holy purity? The sixth commandment forbids whatever is contrary to holy purity in looks, words, or actions. Are immodest plays and dances forbidden by the sixth commandment? Immodest plays and dances are forbidden by the sixth commandment, and it is sinful to look at them. Does the sixth commandment forbid immodest songs, books, and pictures? The sixth commandment forbids immodest songs, books and pictures because they are most dangerous to the soul and lead to mortal sin. What is the seventh commandment? The seventh commandment is, you shall not steal. What does the seventh commandment forbid? The seventh commandment forbids all unjust taking away or keeping what belongs to another. Is all manner of cheating in buying and selling forbidden by the seventh commandment? All manner of cheating in buying and selling is forbidden by the seventh commandment and also every other way of wronging our neighbor. 
Are we bound to restore ill-gotten goods? We are bound to restore ill-gotten goods if we are able, or else the sin will not be forgiven. We must also pay our debts. Is it dishonest in employees to waste their employer's time or property? It is dishonest in employees to waste their employer's time or property because it is wasting what is not their own. What is the Eighth Commandment? The Eighth Commandment is, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. What does the Eighth Commandment forbid? The Eighth Commandment forbids all false testimony, rash judgment, and lies. Are calumny and detraction forbidden by the Eighth Commandment? Calumny and detraction are forbidden by the Eighth Commandment, and also tail-bearing and any words which injure our neighbor's character. If you have injured your neighbor by speaking ill of him, what are you bound to do? If I have injured my neighbor by speaking ill of him, I am bound to make him satisfaction by restoring his good name as far as I can. What is the Ninth Commandment? The Ninth Commandment is, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. What does the Ninth Commandment forbid? The Ninth Commandment forbids all willful consent to impure thoughts and desires, and all willful pleasure to the irregular motions of the flesh. What sins commonly lead to the breaking of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments? The sins that commonly lead to the breaking of the Sixth and Ninth Commandments are gluttony, drunkenness, and intemperance, and also idleness, bad company, and the neglect of prayer. What is the Tenth Commandment? The Tenth Commandment is, you shall not covet your neighbor's goods. What does the Tenth Commandment forbid? The Tenth Commandment forbids all envious and covetous thoughts and unjust desires of our neighbor's goods and profits. Chapter 5, The Commandments of the Church Are we bound to obey the Church? We are bound to obey the Church because Christ has said to the pastors of the Church, He that hears you hears me, and he that despises you despises me. Luke chapter 10 verse 16. What are the chief commandments of the church? The chief commandments of the church are 1. To keep the Sundays and holy days of obligation holy by hearing mass and resting from servile works. 2. To keep the days of fasting and abstinence appointed by the church. 3 to go to confession at least once a year. Four, to receive the Blessed Sacrament at least once a year, and that at Easter or thereabouts. Five, to contribute to the support of our pastors. And six, to not marry within certain degrees of kindred, nor to solemnize marriage at the forbidden times. What is the first commandment of the church? The first commandment of the church is to keep the Sundays and holy days of obligation holy by hearing Mass and resting from servile works. Which are the holy days of obligation observed in the United States? The holy days of obligation observed in the United States are Solemnity of the Holy Mother of God, January 1st, the Ascension, the Assumption of Our Lady, August 15th, all Saints' Day, November 1st, the Immaculate Conception, December 8th, Christmas Day, December 25th. Is it a mortal sin to neglect to hear Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation? It is a mortal sin to neglect to hear Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. Are parents, masters, and mistresses bound to provide that those under their charge shall hear Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. Parents, masters, and mistresses are bound to provide that those under their charge shall hear Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. What is the second commandment of the Church? The second commandment of the Church is 
to keep the days of fasting and abstinence appointed by the church. What are fasting days? Fasting days are days on which we are allowed to take only one full meal. Which are the fasting days? The fasting days are Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. What are days of abstinence? Days of abstinence are days on which we are forbidden to take flesh meat and soups made from meat. Which are the days of abstinence? The days of abstinence are Ash Wednesday, Good Friday, and the Fridays, all the Fridays in Lent. Why does the church command us to fast and abstain? The church commands us to fast and abstain that so we may mortify the flesh and satisfy God for our sins. What is the third commandment of the church? The third commandment of the church is to go to confession at least once a year. How soon are children bound to go to confession? Children are bound to go to confession as soon as they have come to the use of reason and are capable of mortal sin. When are children generally supposed to come to the use of reason? Children are generally supposed to come to the use of reason about the age of seven years. What is the fourth commandment of the church? The fourth commandment of the church is to receive the blessed sacrament at least once a year and that at Easter or thereabouts. How soon are Christians bound to receive the blessed sacrament? Christians are bound to receive the blessed sacrament as soon as they are capable of distinguishing the body of Christ from ordinary bread and are judged to be sufficiently instructed. What is the fifth commandment of the church? The fifth commandment of the church is to contribute to the support of our pastors. Is it a duty to contribute to the support of religion? It is a duty to contribute to the support of religion according to our means, so that God may be duly honored and worshiped, and that the kingdom of his church extended. What is the sixth commandment of the church? The sixth commandment of the church is not to marry within certain degrees of kindred, nor to solemnize marriage at the forbidden times. Which are the times in which it is forbidden to marry with solemnity? The times in which it is forbidden to marry with solemnity without special leave are from the first Sunday of Advent till after Christmas Day and from Ash Wednesday till after Easter Sunday. Chapter 6 The Sacraments What is a sacrament. A sacrament is an outward sign of inward grace ordained by Jesus Christ by which grace is given to our souls. Do the sacraments always give grace? The sacraments always give grace to those who receive them worthily. Whence have the sacraments the power of giving grace? The sacraments have the power of giving grace from the merits of Christ's precious blood, which they apply to our souls. Ought we to have a great desire to receive the sacraments? We ought to have a great desire to receive the sacraments because they are the chief means of our salvation. Is a character given to the soul by any of the sacraments? A character is given to the soul by the sacraments of baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. What is a character? A character is a mark or seal on the soul which cannot be effaced, and therefore the sacrament conferring it may not be repeated. How many sacraments are there? There are seven sacraments, baptism, confirmation, holy eucharist, penance, sacrament of the sick, holy orders, and matrimony. What is baptism? Baptism is a sacrament which cleanses us from original sin, makes us Christians, children of God, and members of the church. Does baptism also forgive actual sins? 
Baptism also forgives actual sins with all punishment due to them when it is received in proper dispositions by those who have been guilty of actual sin. Who is the ordinary minister of baptism? The ordinary minister of baptism is a priest, but anyone may baptize in case of necessity when a priest cannot be had. How is baptism given? Baptism is given by pouring water on the head of the child, saying at the same time these words, I baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What do we promise in baptism? We promise in baptism to renounce the devil and all his works and pomps. Is baptism necessary for salvation? Baptism is necessary for salvation because Christ has said, unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. What is confirmation? Confirmation is a sacrament by which we receive the Holy Spirit in order to make us strong and perfect Christians and soldiers of Jesus Christ. Who is the ordinary minister of confirmation? The ordinary minister of confirmation is a bishop. However, it may also be administered by a priest. How does the bishop administer the sacrament of confirmation? The bishop administers the sacrament of confirmation by praying that the Holy Spirit may come down upon those who are to be confirmed and by laying his hand on them and making the sign of the cross with chrism on their foreheads, at the same time pronouncing certain words. What are the words used in confirmation? The words used in confirmation are these, I sign you with the sign of the cross, and I confirm you with the chrism of salvation, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What is the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist? The sacrament of the Holy Eucharist is the true body and blood of Jesus Christ, together with his soul and divinity, under the appearances of bread and wine. How are the bread and wine changed into the body and blood of Christ? The bread and wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ by the power of God, to whom nothing is impossible or difficult. When are the bread and wine changed into the body and blood of Christ? The bread and wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ when the words of consecration ordained by Jesus Christ are pronounced by the priest in Holy Mass. Why has Christ given himself to us in the Holy Eucharist? Christ has given himself to us in the Holy Eucharist to be the life and food of our souls. He that eats me, the same also shall live by me. He that eats this bread shall live forever. John chapter 6, verses 58 and 59. Is Christ received whole and entire under either kind alone? Christ is received whole and entire under either kind alone. In order to receive the blessed sacrament worthily, what is required? In order to receive the blessed sacrament worthily, it is required that we be in a state of grace and keep the prescribed fast. Water does not break this fast. What is it to be in a state of grace? To be in a state of grace is to be free from mortal sin and pleasing to God. Is it a great sin to receive Holy Communion in mortal sin? It is a great sin to receive Holy Communion in mortal sin, for he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks judgment to himself. First, is the Blessed Eucharist a sacrament only? The Blessed Eucharist is not a sacrament only, it is also a sacrifice. What is a sacrifice? 
A sacrifice is the offering of a victim by a priest to God alone in testimony of his being the sovereign Lord of all things. What is the sacrifice of the new law? The sacrifice of the new law is the Holy Mass. What is the Holy Mass? The Holy Mass is the sacrifice of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, really present on the altar under the appearances of bread and wine, and offered to God for the living and the dead. Is the Holy Mass one and the same sacrifice with that of the cross? The Holy Mass is one and the same sacrifice with that of the cross, inasmuch as Christ, who offered himself a bleeding victim on the cross to his heavenly Father, continues to offer himself in an unbloody manner on the altar through the ministry of his priests. For what ends is the sacrifice of the Mass offered? The sacrifice of the Mass is offered for four ends. First, to give supreme honor and glory to God. Secondly, to thank him for all his benefits. Thirdly, to satisfy God for our sins and to obtain the grace of repentance. And fourthly, to obtain all other graces and blessings through Jesus Christ. Is the Mass also a memorial of the passion and death of our Lord? The Mass is also a memorial of the passion and death of our Lord, for Christ at his Last Supper said, Do this for a commemoration of me. What is the Sacrament of Penance? Penance is a sacrament whereby the sins, whether mortal or venial, which we have committed after baptism, are forgiven. Does the sacrament of penance increase the grace of God in the soul? The sacrament of penance increases the grace of God in the soul, besides forgiving sin. We should therefore often go to confession. When did our Lord institute the sacrament of penance? Our Lord instituted the sacrament of penance when he breathed on his apostles and gave them power to forgive sins, saying, Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. John chapter 20, verse 23. How does the priest forgive sins? The priest forgives sins by the power of God when he pronounces the words of absolution. What are the words of absolution? The words of absolution are, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Are any conditions of forgiveness required on the part of the penitent? Three conditions for forgiveness are required on the part of the penitent, contrition, confession, and satisfaction. What is contrition? Contrition is a hearty sorrow for our sins because by them we have offended so good a God together with a firm purpose of amendment. What is a firm purpose of amendment? A firm purpose of amendment is a resolution to avoid by the grace of God not only sin but also the dangerous occasions of sin. How may we obtain a hearty sorrow for our sins? We may obtain a hearty sorrow for our sins by earnestly praying for it and by making use of such considerations as may lead us to it. What consideration concerning God will lead us to sorrow for our sins? This consideration concerning God will lead us to sorrow for our sins, that by our sins we have offended God, who is infinitely good in himself, and infinitely good to us. What consideration concerning our Savior will lead us to sorrow for our sins? This consideration concerning our Savior will lead us to sorrow for our sins, that our Savior died for our sins, and that those who sin grievously crucify again to themselves the Son of God, making him a mockery. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 6. 
is sorrow for our sins because by them we have lost heaven and deserved hell sufficient when we go to confession sorrow for our sins because by them we have lost heaven and deserved hell is sufficient when we go to confession what is perfect contrition perfect contrition is sorrow for sin arising purely from the love of God what special value has perfect contrition perfect contrition has this special value that by it our sins are forgiven immediately even before we confess them but nevertheless if they are mortal we are strictly bound to confess them afterwards what is confession confession is to accuse ourselves of our sins to a priest approved by the bishop what if a person willfully conceal a mortal sin in confession if a person willfully conceal a mortal sin in confession he is guilty of a great sacrilege by telling a lie to the Holy Spirit in making a bad confession how many things have we to do in order to prepare for confession we have four things to do in order to prepare for confession first we must heartily pray for grace to make a good confession secondly we must carefully examine our conscience thirdly we must take time and care to make a good act of contrition and fourthly we must resolve by the help of God to renounce our sins and to begin a new life for the future what is satisfaction satisfaction is doing the penance given us by the priest does the penance given by the priest always make full satisfaction for our sins the penance given by the priest does not always make full satisfaction for our sins we should therefore add to it other good works and penances and try to gain indulgences what is an indulgence an indulgence is a remission granted by the church of the temporal punishment which often remains due to sin after its guilt has been forgiven what is the sacrament of the sick the sacrament of the sick is the anointing of the sick with holy oil accompanied with prayer to whom is the sacrament of the sick given the sacrament of the sick is given to those who are dangerously ill due to sickness or old age what are the effects of the sacrament of the sick the person who is seriously ill needs the special help of God's grace in this time of anxiety lest he be broken in spirit and subject to temptations and the weakening of faith the effect of the sacrament of the sick then are to comfort and strengthen the soul to remit sin and even to restore health when God sees it to be expedient what authority is there in scripture for the sacrament of the sick the authority in scripture for the sacrament of the sick is the fifth chapter of St. James where it is said is anyone sick among you let him bring in the priest of the church and let them pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick man and the Lord shall raise him up and if he be in sins they shall be forgiven him James chapter 5 verses 14 and 15 what is the sacrament of holy orders holy orders is the sacrament by which bishop, bishops priests and other ministers of the church are ordained and receive power and grace to perform their sacred duties what is the sacrament of matrimony matrimony is the sacrament which sanctifies the contract of a Christian marriage and gives a special grace to those who receive it worthily what special grace does the sacrament of matrimony give to those who receive it worthily 
The sacrament of matrimony gives to those who receive it worthily a special grace to enable them to bear the difficulties of their state, to love and to be faithful to one another, and to bring up their children in the fear of God. Is it a sacrilege to contract marriage in mortal sin or in disobedience to the laws of the church? It is a sacrilege to contract marriage in mortal sin or in disobedience to the laws of the church, and instead of a blessing, the guilty parties draw upon themselves the anger of God. A footnote, for the marriage of a Catholic to be valid, there must be present either the bishop or the parish priest or another priest duly delegated and two witnesses. What is a mixed marriage? A mixed marriage is a marriage between a Catholic and one who, though baptized, does not profess the Catholic faith. Has the Church always forbidden mixed marriages? The Church has always forbidden mixed marriages and considered them unlawful and pernicious. Does the Church sometimes permit mixed marriages? The Church sometimes permits mixed marriages by granting a dispensation for serious reasons and under special conditions. When reasons are proper, a dispensation may be granted to allow the marriage in the presence of a Catholic priest and non-Catholic ministers. Can any human power dissolve the bond of marriage? No human power can dissolve the bond of marriage because Christ has said, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Matthew chapter 19, verse 6. Chapter 7. In the Pentecatechism of Vices and Virtues. Which are the theological virtues? The theological virtues are faith, hope, and charity. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. Why are they called theological virtues? They are called theological virtues because they relate immediately to God. What are the chief mysteries of faith which every Christian is bound to know? The chief mysteries of faith which every Christian is bound to know are the unity and trinity of God who will render to every man according to his works and the incarnation, death, and resurrection of our Savior. Which are the cardinal virtues? The cardinal virtues are prudence, justice, fortitude, and temperance. Wisdom, chapter 8, verse 7. Why are they called cardinal virtues? They are called cardinal virtues because they are, as it were, the hinges on which all other moral virtues turn. We will continue with the Penny Catechism on tape number two. Please join us. Number two, the Penny Catechism, 370 Fundamental Questions and Answers on the Catholic Faith. We continue with chapter 7 of Vices and Virtues. Which are the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit? The seven gifts of the Holy Spirit are wisdom, understanding, counsel, fortitude, knowledge, piety, and the fear of the Lord. Which are the twelve fruits of the Holy Spirit. The twelve fruits of the Holy Spirit are charity, joy, peace, patience, benignity, goodness, long and enemy, mildness, faith, modesty, continency, and chastity. Which are the two precepts of charity? The two great precepts of charity are, you shall love the Lord your God with your whole heart and with your whole soul 
and with your whole mind and with your whole strength. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Which are the seven corporal works of mercy? The seven corporal works of mercy are to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to harbor the harborless, to visit the sick, to visit the imprisoned, and to bury the dead. Which are the seven spiritual works of mercy? The seven spiritual works of mercy are to convert the sinner, to instruct the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to comfort the sorrowful, to bear wrongs patiently, to forgive injuries, and to pray for the living and the dead. Which are the eight Beatitudes? The eight Beatitudes are, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after justice, for they shall have their fill. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And blessed are they that suffer persecution for justice' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Which are the seven capital sins or vices and their contrary virtues? The seven capital sins or vices and their contrary virtues are pride, covetousness, lust, anger, gluttony, envy, and sloth. The contrary virtues are humility, liberality, chastity, meekness, temperance, brotherly love, and diligence. Why are they called capital sins? They are called capital sins because they are the sources from which all other sins take their rise. Which are the six sins against the Holy Spirit? The six sins against the Holy Spirit are presumption, despair, resisting the known truth, envy of another's spiritual good, obstinacy in sin, and final impenitence. Which are the four sins crying to heaven for vengeance? The four sins crying to heaven for vengeance are willful murder, the sin of Sodom, oppression of the poor, and defrauding laborers of their wages. When are we answerable for the sins of others? We are answerable for the sins of others whenever we either cause them or share them through our own fault. In how many ways may we either cause or share the guilt of another's sin? We may either cause or share the guilt of another's sin in nine ways, by counsel, by command, by consent, by provocation, by praise or flattery, by concealment, by being a partner in the sin, by silence, or by defending the ill done. Which are the three eminent good works? The three eminent good works are prayer, fasting, and alms deeds. Which are the evangelical counsels? The evangelical counsels are voluntary poverty, perpetual chastity, and entire obedience. What are the four last things to be ever remembered? The four last things to be ever remembered are death, judgment, hell, and heaven. From Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Chapter 8, The Christian's Rule of Life. What rule of life must we follow if we hope to be saved? If we hope to be saved, we must follow the rule of life taught by Jesus Christ. 
What are we bound to do by the rule of life taught by Jesus Christ? By the rule of life taught by Jesus Christ, we are bound always to hate sin and to love God. How must we hate sin? We must hate sin above all other evils so as to be resolved never to commit a willful sin for the love or fear of anything whatsoever. How must we love God? We must love God above all things and with our whole heart. How must we learn to love God? We must learn to love God by begging of God to teach us to love him. O oh my God, teach me to love you. What will the love of God lead us to do? The love of God will lead us often to think how good God is, often to speak to him in our hearts, and always to seek to please him. Does Jesus Christ also command us to love one another? Jesus Christ also commands us to love one another, that is, all persons without exception for his sake. How are we to love one another? We are to love one another by wishing well to one another and praying for one another, and by never allowing ourselves any thought, word, or deed to the injury of anyone. Are we also bound to love our enemies? We are also bound to love our enemies, not only by forgiving them from our hearts, but also by wishing them well and praying for them. Has Jesus Christ given us another great rule? Jesus Christ has given us another great rule in these words. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Luke chapter 9 verse 23. How are we to deny ourselves? We are to deny ourselves by giving up our own will and by going against our own humors, inclinations, and passions. Why are we bound to deny ourselves? We are bound to deny ourselves because our natural inclinations are prone to evil from our very childhood, and if not corrected by self-denial, they will certainly carry us to hell. How are we to take up our cross daily? We are to take up our cross daily by submitting daily with patience to the labors and sufferings of this short life, and by bearing them willingly for the love of God. How are we to follow our blessed Lord? We are to follow our blessed Lord by walking in his footsteps and imitating his virtues. What are the principal virtues we are to learn of our blessed Lord? The principal virtues we are to learn of our blessed Lord are meekness, humility, and obedience. Which are the enemies we must fight against all the days of our life? The enemies which we must fight against all the days of our life are the devil, the world, and the flesh. What do you mean by the devil? By the devil I mean Satan and all his wicked angels who are ever seeking to draw us into sin that we may be damned with them. What do you mean by the world? By the world I mean the false maxims of the world and the society of those who love the vanities, riches, and pleasures of this world better than God. Why do you number the devil and the world among the enemies of the soul? I number the devil and the world among the enemies of the soul because they are always seeking by temptation and by word or example to carry us along with them in the broad road that leads to damnation. What do you mean by the flesh? By the flesh I mean our own corrupt inclinations and passions which are the most dangerous of all our enemies. What must we do to hinder the enemies of our soul from drawing us into sin? To hinder the enemies of our soul from drawing us into sin, we must watch, pray, and fight against all of their suggestions and temptations. 
In the warfare against the devil, the world, and the flesh, on whom must we depend? In the warfare against the devil, the world, and the flesh, we must depend not on ourselves, but on God. I can do all things in him who strengthens me. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Chapter 9, The Christian's Daily Exercise How should you begin the day? I should begin the day by making the sign of the cross as soon as I awake in the morning and by saying some short prayer, such as, O oh my God, I offer my heart and soul to you. How should you rise in the morning? I should rise in the morning diligently, dress myself modestly, and then kneel down and say my morning prayers. Should you also hear Mass, if you have time and opportunity? I should also hear Mass if I have time and opportunity, for to hear Mass is by far the best and most profitable of all devotions. Is it useful to make daily meditations, for such was the practice of all the saints? It is useful to make daily meditation, for such was the practice of all the saints. On what ought we meditate? We ought to meditate especially on the four last things and the life and passion of our blessed Lord. Ought we frequently to read good books? We ought frequently to read good books, such as the Holy Gospels and the lives of the saints and other spiritual works, which nourish our faith and piety and arm us against the false maxims of the world. And what should you do as to your eating, drinking, sleeping, and amusements? As to my eating, drinking, sleeping, and amusements, I should use all these things with moderation and with a desire to please God. Say the grace before meals. Bless us, O Lord, and these your gifts, which we are going to receive from your bounty. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Say the grace after meals. We give you thanks, Almighty God, for all your benefits, who lives and reigns, world without end, Amen. May the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. How should you sanctify your ordinary actions and employments of the day? I should sanctify my ordinary actions and employments of the day by often raising up my heart to God while I am about them and saying some short prayer to him. What should you do when you find yourself tempted to sin? When I find myself tempted to sin, I should make the sign of the cross on my heart and call on God as earnestly as I can, saying, Lord, save me, or I perish. If you have fallen into sin, what should you do? If I have fallen into sin, I should cast myself in spirit at the feet of Christ and humbly beg his pardon by a sincere act of contrition. When God sends you any cross or sickness or pain, what should you say? When God sends me any cross or sickness or pain, I should say, Lord, your will be done. I take this for my sins. What little indulgence prayers would you do well to say often to yourself? during the day. I should do well to say often to myself during the day such little indulgence prayers as Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In all things may the most holy, the most just, and the most lovable will of God be done, praised and exalted above all, forever. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. Praised be Jesus Christ, praised forevermore. My Jesus mercy, Mary help. 
How should you finish the day? I should finish the day by kneeling down and saying my night prayers. After your night prayers, what should you do? After my night prayers, I should observe due modesty in going to bed, occupy myself with the thoughts of death, and endeavor to compose myself to rest at the foot of the cross and give my last thoughts to my crucified Savior. We continue now with the appendix to the Penny Catechism. First, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Confidior. I confess to Almighty God, to blessed Mary ever virgin, to blessed Michael the Archangel, to blessed John the Baptist, to the holy apostles Peter and Paul, and to all the saints, that I have sinned exceedingly in thoughts, word, and deed, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I beseech Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, Blessed Michael the Archangel, Blessed John the Baptist, the Holy Apostles Peter and Paul, and all the saints, to pray for me to the Lord our God. Amen. An Act of Faith O oh my God, I believe in you and all your church does teach, because you have said it and your word is true. An act of hope. My God, I hope in you for grace and for glory because of your promises, your mercy, and your power. An act of charity. My God, because you are so good, I love you with all my heart, and for your sake I love my neighbor as myself. An act of contrition. O oh my God, because you are so good, I am very sorry that I have sinned against you, and by the help of your grace, I will not sin again. A longer act of contrition. O oh my God, I am sorry, and I beg pardon for all my sins, and I detest them above all things, because they deserve your dreadful punishments, because they have crucified my loving Savior, Jesus Christ, and most of all, because they offend your infinite goodness. And I firmly resolve, by the help of your grace, never to offend you again, and carefully to avoid the occasions of sin. The Mysteries of the Holy Rosary, the Five Joyful Mysteries, the Annunciation, the Visitation, the Nativity, the presentation, and the finding in the temple. The five sorrowful mysteries, the agony in the garden, the scourging at the pillar, the crowning with thorns, the carrying of the cross, and the crucifixion. The five glorious mysteries, the resurrection, the ascension, 
the descent of the Holy Spirit, the assumption and the coronation of Our Lady. The divine praises, blessed be God, blessed be his holy name, blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man, blessed be the name of Jesus, blessed be his most sacred heart, blessed be Jesus in the most holy sacrament of the altar, blessed be his most precious blood, blessed be the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, blessed be the great mother of God, Mary most holy, Blessed be her holy and immaculate conception. Blessed be her glorious assumption. Blessed be the name of Mary, virgin and mother. Blessed be Saint Joseph, her most chaste spouse. Blessed be God in his angels and in his saints. The Angelus. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary, and she conceived of the Holy Spirit and recite to Hail Mary. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to thy word. Again recite the Hail Mary. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Hail Mary once again. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us pray. Pour forth we beseech you, O Lord, your grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ your Son was made known by the message of an angel, may be brought by his passion and cross to the glory of his resurrection. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. The Regine Chaley, to be said standing during Paschal time instead of the Angelus. Queen of heaven, rejoice, alleluia. For he whom you did merit to bear, alleluia, has risen as he said, alleluia. Pray for us to God, alleluia. Rejoice and be glad, O Virgin Mary, alleluia. For the Lord has risen indeed, alleluia. Let us pray. O God, who gave joy to the world through the resurrection of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, grant that we may obtain, through his Virgin Mother, Mary, the joys of everlasting life. Through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. The Salve Regina. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy. Hail, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To you do we cry, poor banished children of Eve, to you do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping, in this veil of tears. Turn then, most gracious Advocate, your eyes of mercy towards us, and after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus, O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. The Memorari. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly to you, O Virgin of Virgins, my mother. To you I come, before you I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petition, but in your mercy, Hear and answer me. Amen. The Magnificat. My soul does magnify the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he has regarded the humility of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty has done great things to me, and holy is his name and his mercy is from generation to generation to them that fear him. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the conceit of their heart. He has put down the mighty from their seat and has exalted the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent empty away. He has upheld his servant Israel 
being mindful of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his seed forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Day Profundus Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If you, O Lord, shall observe iniquities, Lord, who shall endure it? For with you there is merciful forgiveness, and by reason of your law I have waited for you, O Lord. My soul has relied on his word. My soul has hoped in the Lord. From the morning watch, even until night, let Israel hope in the Lord. Because with the Lord there is mercy, and with him plentiful redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Eternal rest give unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come unto you. Let us pray. O God, the Creator and Redeemer of all the faithful, grant to the soul of your servants departed the remission of all their sins, that through their pious supplication they may obtain that pardon which they have always desired, who lives and reigns world without end. Amen. A Morning Offering O Jesus, through the most pure heart of Mary, I offer you the prayers, works, and sufferings of this day for all the intentions of your divine heart. An Aspiration Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, I give you my heart and my soul. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, assist me in my last agony. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, may I die in peace and in your blessed company. A prayer to the guardian angel. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love entrust me here, ever this day be at my side, to light and guard, to rule and guide. A spiritual communion. I wish my Lord to receive you with the purity, humility, and devotion with which your most holy mother received you, with the spirit and fervor of the saints. conclude the Penny Catechism with 370 fundamental questions and answers on the Catholic faith along with the prayers. We continue now with instructions on the Catechism from the Curé of ours to his people, St. John Vianney, the Catechism on Communion. Whether we will or not, we must suffer. He looked over creation, found nothing that was worthy of it. He then turned to himself and resolved to give himself. O oh, my soul, how great thou art! since nothing less than God can satisfy thee. The food of the soul is the body and blood of God. 
Oh, admirable food! If we considered it, it would make us lose ourselves in that abyss of love for all eternity. How happy are the pure souls that have the happiness of being united to our Lord by communion. They will shine like beautiful diamonds in heaven because God will be seen in them. Our Lord has said, Whatever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. We should never have thought of asking of God his own Son. But God has done what man could not have imagined. What man cannot express nor conceive and what he never would have dared to desire, God in his love has said, has conceived and has executed. Should we ever have dared to ask of God to put his Son to death for us? to give us his flesh to eat and his blood to drink? If all this were not true, then man might have imagined things that God cannot do. He would have gone farther than God in inventions of love. That is impossible. Without the Holy Eucharist, there would be no happiness in this world. Life would be insupportable. When we receive Holy Communion, we receive our joy and our happiness. The good God, wishing to give himself to us in the sacrament of his love, gave us a vast and great desire which he alone can satisfy. In the presence of this beautiful sacrament, we are like a person dying of thirst by the side of a river. He would only need to bend his head. Like a person still remaining poor, close to a great treasure, he need only stretch out his hand. He who communicates loses himself in God like a drop of water in the ocean. They can no more be separated. At the day of judgment, we shall see the flesh of our Lord shine through the glorified body of those who have received him worthily on earth, as we can see gold shine in copper or silver in lead. When we have just communicated, if we were asked, what are you carrying away to your home? We might answer, I am carrying away heaven. A saint said that we were Christ bearers. It was very true, but we have not enough faith. We do not comprehend our dignity. When we leave the holy banquet, we are as happy as the wise men would have been if they could have carried away the infant Jesus. Take a vessel full of liquor and cork it well. You will keep the liquor as long as you please. So if you were to keep our Lord well and recollectedly after communion, you would long feel that devouring fire which would inspire your heart with an inclination to good and a repugnance to evil. When we have the good God in our heart, it ought to be very burning. The heart of the disciples of Emmaus burned within them from merely listening to his voice. I do not like people to begin to read directly when they come from the holy table. Oh no, what is the use of the words of men when God is speaking? We must do as one who is very curious and listens at the door. We must listen to all that God says at the door of our heart. When you have received our Lord, you feel your soul purified because it bathes itself in the love of God. When we go to Holy Communion, we feel something extraordinary, a comfort which pervades the whole body and penetrates to the extremities. What is this comfort? It is our Lord who communicates himself to all parts of our bodies and makes them thrill. We are obliged to say like St. John, it is the Lord. Those who feel absolutely nothing are very much to be pitied. My children, all beings in creation require to be fed, that they may live. For this purpose, God has made trees and plants grow. It is a well-served table to which all animals come and take the food which suits each one. But the soul also must be fed. Where then is its food? My brethren, the food of the soul is God. Ah, what a beautiful thought. The soul can feed on nothing but God. Only God can suffice for it. Only God can fill it. Only God can satisfy its hunger. It absolutely 
requires its God. There is in all houses a place where the provisions of the family are kept. It is the storeroom. The church is the home of souls. It is the house belonging to us who are Christians. Well, in this house, there is a storeroom. Do you see the tabernacle? If the souls of Christians were asked, what is that? Your souls would answer, it is the storeroom. There is nothing so great, my children, as the Eucharist. Put all the good works in the world against one good communion. They will be like a grain of dust beside a mountain. Make a prayer when you have the good God in your heart. The good God will not be able to refuse you anything. If you offer him his son and the merits of his holy death and passion. My children, if we understood the value of Holy Communion, we should avoid the least faults that we might have the happiness of making it oftener. We should keep our souls always pure in the eyes of God. My children, let's suppose that you've been to confession today and that you will watch over yourselves. You will be happy in the thought that tomorrow you will have the joy of receiving the good God into your heart. Neither can you offend the good God tomorrow. Your soul will be all embalmed with the precious blood of our Lord. Oh, beautiful life. Oh, my children, how beautiful will a soul be in eternity that has worthily and often received the good God. The body of our Lord will shine through our body, his adorable blood through our blood. Our soul will be united to the soul of our Lord during all eternity. There it will enjoy pure and perfect happiness. My children, when the soul of a Christian who has received our Lord enters paradise, it augments the joy of heaven. The angels and the queen of angels come to meet it because they recognize the Son of God in that soul. Then will that soul be rewarded for the pains and sacrifices it will have endured in its life on earth. My children, we know when a soul has worthily received the sacrament of the Eucharist, it is so drowned in love, so penetrated and changed, that it is no longer to be recognized in its words or its actions. It is humble, it is gentle, it is mortified, charitable, and modest. It is at peace with everyone. It is a soul capable of the greatest sacrifices. In short, you would not know it again. Go then to communion, my children. Go to Jesus with love and confidence. Go and live upon him in order to live for him. Do not say that you have too much to do. Has not the divine Savior said, Come to me, all you that labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you? Can you resist an invitation so full of love and tenderness? Do not say that you're not worthy of it. It is true, you are not worthy of it, but you are in need of it. If our Lord has regarded our worthiness, he would never have instituted his beautiful sacrament of love, for no one in the world is worthy of it, neither the saints, nor the angels, nor the archangels, nor the Blessed Virgin. But he had in view our needs, and we are all in need of it. Do not say that you're sinners, that you're too miserable, and for that reason you not, do not dare to approach it. I would as soon hear you say that you are very ill, and therefore you will not take any remedy, nor send for the physician. We will continue with the words of the curé of ours to his people on side B of this tape. Please join us. We continue now with the Catechism on Frequent Communion from the Curé of ours to his people. All the prayers of the Mass are a preparation for communion, and all the life of a Christian ought to be a preparation for this great action. We ought to labor to deserve to receive our Lord every day. How humbled we ought to feel when we see others going to the holy table and we remain motionless in our place. 
How happy is a guardian angel who leads a beautiful soul to the holy table. In the primitive church, they communicated every day. When Christians had grown cold, they substituted blessed bread for the body of our Lord. This is both a consolation and a humiliation. It is indeed blessed bread, but it is not the body and blood of our Lord. There are some who make a spiritual communion every day with blessed bread. If we are deprived of sacramental communion, let us replace it as far as we can by spiritual communion, which we can make every moment. For we ought to have always a burning desire to receive the good God. Communion is to the soul like blowing a fire that's beginning to go out, but that has still plenty of hot embers. We blow and the fire burns again. After the reception of the sacraments, when we feel ourselves slacken in the love of God, let us have recourse at once to spiritual communion. When we cannot come to church, let us turn towards the tabernacle. A wall cannot separate us from the good God. Let us say five potters and five aves to make a spiritual communion. We can receive the good God only once a day. A soul on fire with love supplies for this by the desire to receive him every moment. O oh man, how great thou art, fed with the body and blood of a God. O oh, how sweet a life is this life of union with the good God. It is heaven upon earth. There is no more troubles, no more crosses. When you have the happiness of having received the good God, you feel a joy, a sweetness in your heart for some moments. Pure souls feel it always, and in this union consist their strength and their happiness. The Catechism on Sin Sin is the executioner of the good God and the assassin of the soul. It snatches us away from heaven to precipitate us into hell, and we love it. What folly! If we thought seriously about it, we should have such a lively horror of sin that we could not commit it. Oh, my children, how ungrateful we are. The good God wishes to make us happy. That's very certain. He gave us his law for no other end. The law of God is great. It is broad. King David said that he found his delight in it and that it was a treasure more precious to him than the greatest riches. He said also that he walked at large because he had sought after the commandments of the Lord. The good God wishes then to make us happy, and we do not wish to be so. We turn away from him and give ourselves to the devil. We fly from our friend and we seek after the murderer. We commit sin, we plunge ourselves into the mire. Once sunk in this mire, we know not how to get out. If our fortune were in the case, we should soon find out how to get out of the difficulty. But because it only concerns our soul, we stay where we are. We come to confession quite preoccupied with shame that we shall feel. We accuse ourselves by stealth. It is said that many confess and few are converted. Believe it so, my children, because few confess with tears of repentance. See, the misfortune is that people do not reflect. If one said to those who work on Sundays, to a young person who'd been dancing for three or four hours, to a man coming out of an alcoholic drunk, what have you been doing? You've been crucifying our Lord. They would be quite astonished because they do not think of it. My children, if you thought of it, we should be seized with horror. It would be impossible for us to do evil. For what has the good God done to us, that we should grieve him thus and put him to death afresh, him who has redeemed us from hell. It would be well if all sinners, when they are going to their guilty pleasures, could, like St. Peter, meet our Lord on the way, who would say to him, I am going to that place where thou art going thyself to be there crucified afresh. Perhaps that might make them reflect. The saints understood how great an outrage sin is against God. 
Some of them passed their lives in weeping for their sins. St. Peter wept all his life. He was still weeping at his death. St. Bernard used to say, Lord, Lord, it is I who fasten thee to the cross. By sin, we despise the good God. We crucify the good God. What a pity it is to lose our souls, which have cost our Lord so many sufferings. What harm has our Lord done us that we should treat him so? If the poor lost souls could come back to the earth, if they were in our place, oh, how senseless we are. The good God calls us to him and we fly from him. He wishes to make us happy and we will not have his happiness. He commands us to love him and we give our hearts to the devil. We employ in ruining ourselves the time he gives us to save our souls. We make war upon him with the means he gave us to serve him. When we offend the good God, if we were to look at our crucifix, we should hear our Lord saying to us in the depths of our soul, Wilt thou too then take the side of my enemies? Wilt thou crucify me afresh? Cast your eyes on our Lord fastened to the cross and say to yourself, That is what it cost my Savior to repair the injury my sins have done to God. A God coming down to earth to be the victim of our sins, a God suffering, a God dying, a God enduring every torment because he would bear the weight of our crimes. At the sight of the cross, let us understand the malice of sin and the hatred we ought to feel for it. Let us enter into ourselves. Let us see what we can do to make amends for our poor life. What a pity it is the good God will say to us at our death, Why hast thou offended me, me who love thee so much? To offend the good God, who has never done us anything but good, to please the devil, who can never do us anything but evil. What folly! Is it not real folly to choose to make ourselves worthy of hell by attaching ourselves to the devil, when we might taste the joys of heaven, even in this life, by uniting ourselves to God by love. One cannot understand this folly. It cannot be enough lamented. Poor sinners seem as if they could not wait for the sentence which will condemn them to the society of the devils. They condemn themselves to it. There is a sort of foretaste in this life of paradise, of hell, and of purgatory. Purgatory is in those souls that are not dead to themselves. Hell is in the heart of the impious. Paradise in that of the perfect who are closely united to our Lord. He who lives in sin takes up the habits and the appearance of the beasts. The beast which has not reason knows nothing but its appetites. So the man who makes himself like the beasts loses his reason and lets himself be guided by the inclinations of his body. He takes his pleasure in good eating and drinking and in enjoying the vanities of the world which pass away like the wind. I pity the poor wretches who run after that wind. They gain very little. They give us a great deal for very little profit. They gave their eternity for the miserable smoke of the world. My children, how sad it is. When a soul is in a state of sin, it may die in that state, and even now whatever it can do is without merit before God. That's the reason why the devil is so pleased when a soul is in sin and perseveres in it, because he thinks that it is working for him, and if it were to die, he would have possession of it. When we are in sin, our soul is all diseased, all rotten. It is pitiful. The thought that the good God sees it ought to make it enter into itself. And then, what pleasure is there in sin? None at all. We have frightful dreams that the devil is carrying us away, that we are falling over precipices. Put yourself on good terms with God. Have recourse to the sacrament of penance. You will sleep as quietly as an angel. You will be glad to waken in the night to pray to God. You will have nothing 
but thanksgiving on your lips. You will rise towards heaven with great facility as an eagle soars through the air. See, my children, how sin degrades man. Of an angel created to love God, it makes a demon who will curse him for all eternity. Ah, if Adam, our first father, had not sinned, and if we did not sin every day, how happy we should be. We should be as happy as the saints in heaven. There would be no more unhappy people on the earth. Oh, how beautiful it would be. In fact, my children, it is sin that brings upon us all calamities, all scourges, war, famine, pestilence, earthquakes, fires, frost, hail, storms, all that afflicts us, all that makes us miserable. See, my children, a person who is in a state of sin is always sad. Whatever he does, he is weary and disgusted with everything, while he who is at peace with God is always happy, always joyous. Oh, beautiful life, oh, beautiful death. My children, we are afraid of death. I can well believe it. It is sin that makes us afraid of death. It is sin that renders death frightful, formidable. It is sin that terrifies the wicked at the hour of the fearful passage. Alas, O oh God, there is reason enough to be terrified, to think that one is accursed, accursed of God. It makes one tremble. Accursed of God. And why? For what do men expose themselves to be accursed of God? For a blasphemy? For a bad thought? For a bottle of wine? For two minutes of pleasure? For two minutes of pleasure to lose God, one soul, heaven, forever. We shall see going up to heaven in body and soul that father, that mother, that sister, that neighbor who were here with us, with whom we have lived, but whom we have not imitated, while we shall go down body and soul to burn in hell. The devils will rush to overwhelm us. All the devils whose advice we followed will come to torment us. My children, if you saw a man prepare a great pile of wood, heaping up faggots one upon another, and when you asked him what he was doing, he were to answer you, I am preparing the fire that is to burn me, what would you think? And if you saw this same man set fire to the pile, and when it was lighted, throw himself upon it, what would you say? This is what we do when we commit sin. It is not God who casts us into hell. We cast ourselves into it by our sins. The lost souls will say, I have lost God, my soul, and heaven. It is through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. He will raise himself out of the fire only to fall back into it. He will always feel the desire of rising because he was created for God, the greatest, the highest of beings, the most high. As a bird shut up in a room flies to the ceiling and falls down again, the justice of God is the ceiling which keeps down the lost. There's no need to prove the existence of hell. Our Lord himself speaks of it when he relates the history of the wicked rich man who cried out, Lazarus, Lazarus. We know very well that there is a hell, but we live as if there were not. We sell our souls for a few pieces of money. We put off our conversion till the hour of death. But who can assure us that we shall have time or strength at that formidable moment which has been feared by all the saints, when hell will gather itself up for a last assault upon us, seeing that it is the decisive moment? There are many people who lose the faith and never see hell till they enter it. The sacraments are administered to them, but ask them if they've committed such a sin, and they will answer you, Oh, settle that as you please. Some people offend the good God every moment. Their heart is an anthill of sins. It's like a spoiled piece of meat, half eaten by worms. No, indeed. If sinners were to think of eternity, of that terrible, 
forever, they would be converted instantly. From the cure of ours to his people, the Catechism on Pride. Pride is that accursed sin which drove the angels out of paradise and hurled them into hell. This sin began with the world. See, my children, we sin by pride in many ways. A person may be proud in his clothes, in his language, in his gestures, even in his manner of walking. Some persons, when they are in the streets, walk along proudly and seem to say to the people they meet, look how tall, how upright I am, how well I walk. Others, when they've done any good action, are never tired of talking of it, and they fail in anything. They're miserable because they think people will have a bad opinion of them. Others are sorry to be seen with the poor if they meet with anybody of consequence. They are always seeking the company of the rich. If by chance they are noticed by the great people of the world, they boast and are vain of it. Others take pride in speaking. If they go to see rich people, they consider what they're going to say. They study fine language, and if they make a mistake of a word, they are very much vexed because they are afraid of being laughed at. But, my children, with a humble person it is not so. Whether he's laughed at or esteemed or praised or blamed, whether he's honored or despised, whether people pay attention to him or pass him by, it is all the same to him. My children, there are again people who give great alms that they may be well thought of, that will never do. These people will reap no fruit from their good works. On the contrary, their alms will turn into sins. We put pride into everything like salt. We like to see that our good works are known. If our virtues are seen, we're pleased. If our faults are perceived, we are sad. I remark that in a great many people, if one says anything to them, it disturbs them, it annoys them. The saints were not like that. They were vexed if the virtues were known and pleased that their imperfections should be seen. A proud person thinks everything he does is well done. He wants to domineer over all those who have to do with him. He's always right. He always thinks his own opinion better than that of others. That will not do. A humble and well-taught person, if he's asked his opinion, gives it at once and then lets others speak. Whether they're right or whether they're wrong, he says nothing more. When St. Aloysius Gonzaga was a student, he never sought to excuse himself when he was reproached with anything. He said what he thought and troubled himself no further about what others might think. If he was wrong, he was wrong. If he was right, he said to himself, I have certainly been wrong some other time. My children, the saints were so completely dead to themselves that they cared very little whether others agreed with them. People in the world say, oh, the saints were simpletons. Yes, they were simpletons in worldly things, but in the things of God they were very wise. They understood nothing about worldly matters, to be sure, because they thought them of so little importance that they paid no attention to them. We continue with the Catechism on Impurity from St. John Vianney. That we may understand how horrible and detestable is this sin which the demons make us commit but which they do not commit themselves, we must consider what a Christian is. A Christian, created in the image of God, redeemed by the blood of a God. A Christian, the child of God, the brother of a God, the heir of a God, a Christian whose body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That is what sin dishonors. We are created to reign one day in heaven, and if we have the misfortune to commit this sin, we become the den of the devils. Our Lord said that nothing impure should enter into his kingdom. Indeed, how could a soul that has rolled itself in this filth go to appear before so pure and so holy a God? We are all like mirrors in which God contemplates himself. How can you expect that God should recognize his likeness in an impure soul? 
There are some souls so dead, so rotten, that they lie in their defilement without perceiving it and can no longer clean themselves from it. Everything leads them to evil. Everything reminds them of evil, even the most holy things. They always have these abominations before their eyes, like the unclean animal that is accustomed to live in filth, that's happy in it, that rolls itself in and goes to sleep in it, that grunts in the mud. These persons are an object of horror in the eyes of God and of the holy angels. See, my children, our Lord was crowned with thorns to expiate our sins of pride. But for this accursed sin, he was scourged and torn to pieces, since he said himself that after his flagellation, all his bones might be counted. Oh, my children, if there were not some pure souls here and there to make amends to the good God and disarm his justice, you would see how we should be punished. For now, this crime is so common in the world that it is enough to make one tremble. One may say, my children, that hell vomits forth its abominations upon the earth, as the chimneys of the steam engine vomit forth smoke. The devil does all he can to defile our soul, and yet our soul is everything. Our body is only a heap of corruption. Go to the cemetery to see what you love when you love your body. As I've often told you, there's nothing so vile as the impure soul. There was once a saint who had asked the good God to show him one, and he saw that poor soul like a dead beast that had been dragged through the streets in the hot sun for a week. By only looking at a person, we know if he's pure. His eyes have an air of candor and modesty which leads you to the good God. Some people, on the contrary, look quite inflamed with passion. Satan places himself in their eyes to make others fall and to lead them to evil. Those who have lost all their purity are like a piece of cloth stained with oil. You may wash it and dry it, and the stain always appears again, so it requires a miracle to cleanse the impure soul. The Catechism on Confession My children, as soon as ever you have a little spot upon your soul, you must do like a person who has a fine globe of glass, which he keeps very carefully. If this globe has a little dust on it, he wipes it with a sponge the moment he perceives it, and there is the globe clear and brilliant. In the same way, as soon as you perceive a little stain on your soul, Take some holy water with respect. Do one of those good works to which the remission of venial sins is attached. An alms, a genuflection to the blessed sacrament, hearing a mass. My children, it's like a person who has a slight illness. He need not go and see the doctor. He may cure himself without. If he has a headache, he need only go to bed. If he's hungry, he has only to eat. But if he has a serious illness, if it is a dangerous wound, he must have the doctor. After the doctor come the remedies. In the same way, when we have fallen into any grievous sin, we must have recourse to the doctor, that is, the priest, and to the remedy, that is, confession. My children, we cannot comprehend the goodness of God towards us in instituting this great sacrament of penance. If we had had a favor to ask of our Lord, we should never have thought of asking him that. But he foresaw our frailty and our inconstancy in well-doing, and his love induced him to do what we should not have dared to ask. If one said to those poor lost souls that have been so long in hell, we are going to place a priest at the gate of hell, all those who wish to confess have only to go out do you think, my children, that a single one would remain? The most guilty would not be afraid of telling their sins, not even of telling them before all the world. Oh, how soon hell would be a desert, and how heaven would be peopled. Well, we have the time and the means which those poor lost souls have not, and I'm quite sure 
that those wretched ones say in hell, O oh, accursed priest, if I had never known you, I should not be so guilty. It's a beautiful thought, my children, that we have a sacrament which heals the wounds of our soul, but we must receive it with good dispositions. Otherwise, we make new wounds upon the old ones. What would you say of a man covered with wounds who is advised to go to the hospital to show himself to the surgeon? The surgeon cures him by giving him remedies. But behold, this man takes his knife, gives himself great blows with it, and makes himself worse than he was before. Well, that is what you often do after leaving the confessional. My children, some people make bad confessions without taking any notice of it. These persons say, I do not know what is the matter with me. They are tormented and they do not know why. They have not the agility which makes one go straight to the good God. They have something heavy and weary about them which fatigues them. My children, that is because of sins that remain often even venial sins, for which one has some affection. There are some people who indeed tell everything, but they have no repentance, and they go at once to Holy Communion. Thus the blood of our Lord is profaned. They go to the Holy Table with a sort of weariness. They say, yet I accuse myself of all my sins. I do not know what's the matter with me. There is an unworthy communion, and they were hardly aware of it. My children, some people again profane the sacraments in another manner. They have concealed mortal sins for ten years, for twenty years. They're always uneasy. Their sin is always present to their mind. They're always thinking of confessing it and always putting it off. It's a hell. When these people feel this, they will ask to make a general confession, and they will tell their sins as if they had just committed them. They will not confess that they have hidden them during 10 years, 20 years. That is a bad confession. They ought to say besides that they had given up the practice of their religion, that they no longer felt the pleasure they had formerly in serving the good God. My children, we run the risk again of profaning the sacrament if we seize the moment when there is a noise around the confessional to tell the sins quickly which give us most pain. We quiet ourselves by saying, I accuse myself properly, so much the worse if the confessor did not hear. So much the worse for you who acted cunningly. At other times we speak quickly profiting by the moment when the priest is not very attentive to get over the great sins. Take a house which has been for a long time very dirty and neglected. It is in vain to sweep out. There will always be a nasty smell. It's the same with our soul after confession. It requires tears to purify it. My children, we must ask earnestly for repentance. After confession, we must plant a thorn in our heart and never lose sight of our sins. We must do as the angel did to St. Francis of Assisi. He fixed in him five darts, which never came out again. The Catechism on Suffering Whether we will or not, we must suffer. There are some who suffer like the good thief and others like the bad thief. They both suffered equally but one knew how to make his suffering meritorious. He accepted them in the spirit of reparation, and turning towards Jesus crucified, he received from his mouth these beautiful words, This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. The other, on the contrary, cried out, uttered imprecations and blasphemies, and expired in the most frightful despair. There are two ways of suffering, to suffer with love and to suffer without love. The saint suffered everything with joy, patience, and perseverance because they loved. As for us, we suffer with anger 
vexation and weariness because we do not love. If we love God, we should love crosses. We should wish for them. We should take pleasure in them. We should be happy to be able to suffer for the love of him who lovingly suffered for us. Of what do we complain? Alas, the poor infidels who have not the happiness of knowing God and his infinite loveliness have the same crosses that we have, but they have not the same consolations. You say it's hard? No, it is easy. It is consoling. It is sweet. It is happiness. Only we must love while we suffer and suffer while we love. On the way of the cross, you see, my children, only the first step is painful. Our greatest cross is the fear of the crosses. We have not the courage to carry our cross, and we are very much mistaken, for whatever we do, the cross holds us tight. We cannot escape from it. What then have we to lose? Why not love our crosses and make use of them to take us to heaven? But on the contrary, most men turn their backs upon crosses and fly before them. The more they run, the more the cross pursues them, the more it strikes and crushes them with burdens. And if you were wise, you would go to meet it like St. Andrew, who said, when he saw the cross prepared for him and raised up into the air, Hail, O good cross, O admirable cross, O desirable cross, receive me into thy arms, withdraw me from among men, and restore me to my master who redeemed me through thee. Listen attentively to this, my children. He who goes to meet the cross goes in the opposite direction to crosses. He meets them, perhaps, but he is pleased to meet them. He loves them. He carries them courageously. They unite him to our Lord. They purify him. They detach him from this world. They remove all obstacles from his heart. They help him to pass through life as a bridge helps us to pass over water. Look at the saints. Look at the saints. When they were not persecuted, they persecuted themselves. A good religious complained one day to our Lord that he was persecuted. He said, O Lord, what have I done to be treated thus? Our Lord answered him, And I, what had I done when I was led to Calvary? Then the religious understood. He wept, he asked pardon, and dared not complain any more. Worldly people are miserable when they have crosses, and good Christians are miserable when they have none. The Christian lives in the midst of crosses, as the fish lives in the sea. Look at St. Catherine. She has two crowns, that of purity and that of martyrdom. How happy she is, that dear little saint, to have chosen to suffer rather than to consent to sin. There was once a religious who loved suffering so much that he fastened a rope from a well round his body. This cord had rubbed off the skin and had by degrees buried itself in the flesh out of which worms came. His brethren asked that he should be run out of the community. He went away happy and pleased to hide himself in a rocky cavern. But the same night, the superior heard our Lord saying to him, Thou hast lost the treasure of thy house. Then he went to fetch back this good saint, and they wanted to see from whence these worms came. The superior had the cord taken off, which was done by turning back the flesh. At last he got well. Very near this, in a neighboring parish, there was a little boy in bed covered with sores, very ill, very miserable. I said to him, My poor little child, you're suffering very much. He answered me, No, sir, today I do not feel the pain I had yesterday, and tomorrow I shall not suffer from the pain I have now. You would like to get well? No, I was naughty before I was ill, and I might be so again. I am very well as I am. We do not understand that because we are too earthly. Children in whom the Holy Ghost dwells 
puts us to shame. If the good God sends us crosses, we resist, we complain, we murmur. We are so averse to whatever con contradicts us that we want to be always in a box of cotton, and we ought to be put in a box of thorns. It is by the cross that we go to heaven. Illnesses, temptations, troubles are so many crosses which take us to heaven. All this will soon be over. Look at the saints who have arrived there before us. The good God does not require of us the martyrdom of the body. He requires only the martyrdom of the heart and of the will. Our Lord is our model. Let us take up our cross and follow him. Let us do like the soldiers of Napoleon. They had to cross a bridge under the fire of grape shot. No one dared to pass it. Napoleon took the colors, marched over first, and they all followed. Let us do the same. Let us follow our Lord who has gone before us. A soldier was telling me one day that during a battle he had marched for half an hour over dead bodies. There was hardly space to tread upon. The ground was all dyed with blood. Thus on the road of life we must walk over crosses and troubles to reach our true country. The cross is the ladder to heaven. How consoling it is to suffer under the eyes of God and to be able to say in the evening at our examination of conscience, Come, my soul, thou hast had today two or three hours of resemblance to Jesus Christ. Thou hast been scourged crowned with thorns, crucified with him. Oh, what a treasure for the hour of death. How sweet it is to die when we have lived on the cross. We ought to run after crosses as a miser runs after money. Nothing but crosses will reassure us at the day of judgment. When that day shall come, we shall be happy in our misfortunes, proud of our humiliations and rich in our sacrifices. If someone said to you, I should like to become rich, what must I do? You would answer him, you must labor. Well, in order to get to heaven, we must suffer. Our Lord shows us the way in the person of Simon the Cyrenian. He calls his friends to carry his cross after him. The good God wishes us never to lose sight of the cross, therefore, it is placed everywhere, by the roadside, on the heights, in the public squares, in order that at the sight of it we may say, see how God has loved us. The cross embraces the world. It is planted at the four corners of the world. There's a share of it for all. Crosses are on the road to heaven like a fine bridge of stone over a river by which to pass it. Christians who do not suffer pass this river by a frail bridge, a bridge of wire, always ready to give way under their feet. He who does not love the cross may indeed be saved, but with great difficulty. He will be a little star in the firmament. He who shall have suffered and fought for his God will shine like a beautiful sun. Crosses, transformed by the flames of love, are like a bundle of thorns thrown into the fire and reduced by the fire to ashes. The thorns are hard, but the ashes are soft. Oh, how much sweetness do souls experience that are all for God in suffering. It's like a mixture into which one puts a great deal of oil. The vinegar remains vinegar, but the oil corrects its bitterness and it can scarcely be perceived. Thus we conclude instructions on the catechism, explanations and exhortations from the Curé of ours to his people, St. John Vianney. We trust and pray that these tapes have been very helpful, inspiring and interesting for you. Please listen to them often and pray for those who made these tapes available to you. We request your help and letting others know that they can obtain copies of this tape and others 
from your religious supply store or order direct from Patrick Henry, Route 2, Box 957, Safford, Arizona, 85546. It's Patrick Henry, Route 2, Box 957.